Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to do a much anticipated ultimate care guide and that is for the American pitcher plants or Saracenia. And yeah, that's how you say that. American pitcher plants are one of the easiest of all carnivorous plants to grow and also one of the very uh, most rewarding in my opinion. I started growing them when I was about 12 years old and I still have my first, second, third, all my old original childhood Saracenia are still right here at the nursery thriving. Lots of them are like this big across. So I want to do this video for you guys so that you can learn how to turn these amazing plants into lifelong friends just like I have. I have real friends too. <laughs> right, Daniela? Anyways, um, back to these amazing plants for one second. So even though we're inside this big, beautiful greenhouse, uh, American pitcher plants are actually perfect outdoor plants in most of the United States. We're here in Northern California, um, which is a vastly different climate from where they're from. Native American pitcher plants are native to the uh, southeastern United States, um, all the way up the eastern seaboard, um, up to Virginia, is as far north as Flava grows, and then Saracenia purpurea. This is the southern purpurea, but uh, that species grows all the way north from Virginia and New Jersey, all the way up into uh, Canada, almost right up against the Hudson Bay, places like Newfoundland. And so the point of that is even though we're in a greenhouse in Northern California, these plants are extremely tough and they actually don't need this greenhouse. And they're also very adaptable because we grow tons and tons of these outside also. And even though, you know, uh, they get much colder in the southeast than we do. They have constant summer rain and we have no summer rain. It's so humid down there and here it's not very humid at all. We can still grow beautiful American pitcher plants outside. And so that's really great for lots of you beginners who are starting to get into this and you probably looked at the Pinthes Loi and fall in love with that, but you're like, okay, but where am I gonna put a greenhouse in this apartment? And while you try to figure that out, you can grow some American pitcher plants. I think it's also really important to um, start with your experience level with all plants, but certainly in this one, it's a bad idea to start off with an Nepenthes Raja that needs really specialized conditions and is very unforgiving. You know, the availability was such that when I was a little boy, I pretty much had to start with Cape Sundew, and then when I was 12, I was able to get some American pitcher plants. There was very hard to get these plants. And so because of that, I was kind of forced to um, level up with these different genera. And I really encourage you guys to do that. And Saracenia is a great entryway carnivorous plant. So within that native range, it gets really, really cold. Um, and so American pitcher plants are temperate plants. And that means they go dormant in the winter time. Now it's mid-September here. And so you can see the leucophilas, the white trumpet plants, are really shining and looking amazing. That's because right near the end of dormancy, they time their best pictures with the harvest moon, which is the brightest full moon of the year. And that just went by here. So that's why they're still hanging on to these great, gorgeous, beautiful pictures. Daniela, if you pan over here though, you can see the flavas, this is seriously no flava, or the yellow trumpet plant, is already starting to look a little bit tatty. And by Halloween, they're gonna look really super tatty. And that's totally normal. Um, you can, if it's bothering you, you can uh, cut those pictures away. Um, nobody's doing that in the wild, so don't feel obligated to do that. But if you're a more persnickety kind of a gardener, um, it's totally okay if you have the time to go in and cut them away so they go brown. You can even, um, cut them right here and just cut that brown top off if you have a lot of time. I have so many that we don't do that here. Um, but at any rate, uh, they do go dormant um, and that's a totally normal thing. Uh, we've done a couple really great videos on dormancy, both on what to do when it gets super cold and what to do if you live in a place like Hawaii or Florida. So I'd encourage you to check those out as well. But I will talk about that a little bit here too. So here in California, we get a lot of questions, you know, what do I have to do about dormancy? The good news is you don't have to do anything. These plants have it under control. They actually know what they're doing. They're keeping track of the time of the year and they're gonna do it um, when the day starts to shorten up and it starts to get a little cold. We're gonna put on our sweaters and they're gonna start sucking back down into that rhizome that they die back to. Um, so they're gonna do that automatically. 
don't worry about it. You don't have to chop them back or any other newbie idea. You don't have to do that. Just let them do their thing. Um, as far as cutting the back goes, oh, well, what to do as far as the winter goes. Um, so if you're here, if you're like in Northern California where the winters aren't gonna get below 15 degrees, and there's actually quite a few places in the US that are that way, um, you don't have to do anything. Just leave it outside in the sun, always sitting in the rainwater or distilled water that we grow all of our plants in. That water can freeze over the cold nights and thaw back out during the day. That's totally a-okay. If you live somewhere where it's going to be colder than 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and there are a lot of the places in the U.S. like that, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that personally, but we do know this happens. We've read about it in books and on the internet. Uh, if it's going to get colder than 15 degrees, you know, as I mentioned, these plants do grow in much colder places like that. You know, in the Hudson Bay, it's gonna get 40 below sometimes. Even in Virginia, it's gonna get really, really cold. So they're surviving in the ground because in the matrix of nature, there's the insulation of the peat itself. There's gonna be grass and uh, other leaf litter on top of the rhizomes and then snow on top of that. And so in that context of nature, most of the plants will survive. Not all of them though. That's something interesting to think about. In nature, um, plants do die. And in our collection, if we have eight of them and six of them make it, that would still be a win in nature, but for us, that's a loss. So you kind of want to baby yours maybe a little bit more than nature if it's going to get super cold than that. And there is such a thing as side freeze, where the freeze will um, move right through these thin plastic pots. So it's going to get really super cold. Probably bring them inside. You don't want to bring them inside to a greenhouse or like uh, put them under lights or baby them too much though because you might trick them into growing in the wrong time of the season and once you throw off that cycle it can be really hard to get them back on cycle without some kind of major setback. So an ideal place would be like a garage that was next to a window where they could get a little bit of the sun. Uh, they won't be actively growing. There'll be no new pictures coming up and that's what dormancy in plants means. And so there won't be any chance for classic etiolation of long stretched out leaves as they search for light. So that won't be happening. They don't need very much light. Light does prevent fungus and help prevent rot. And so the more light, if you could get some light on there, that would be a good idea. Natural light, no grow lights. Um, then just leave them. Uh, usually they'll start to grow, like I said, on their own, just as the night temperatures start to warm up. And you can put them back outside when the night temperatures are no longer dropping below freezing or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the dormant plants are capable of taking temperatures much colder than that. But as these new little tips start to grow, like this is a new pitcher growing right here, they're very tender. And so if I put that outside in a big hurry and it could take another freeze that night, you will lose that pitcher. And they do tend to start growing their flower buds first. And so it's easy to freeze your flower buds off if you're um, not careful. So if you don't have a garage, um, and you don't have like a cool room or somewhere else to keep them in, there is a fridge method, and we do talk about that more in depth, but basically you can bare root the entire plant, wash all the soil away, put it in a Ziploc bag with either a paper towel or a little bit of damp sphagnum. Damp sphagnum is better because it's antifungal and antibiotic. The paper towel might be a little moldy by the time you open it up in the spring, but sphagnum won't be. Uh, like I said, I go deeper in that, but you can do that because 40 degrees is a lot warmer than 40 below outside. So it's a little counterintuitive, but you can put them in the fridge. So say you're in Hawaii or uh, Miami and you really, really want to grow Saracenia. That's going to be hard for you. For you, you might take a hard look at Nepenthes or tropical pitcher plants. Those will be easier for you to grow outdoors. Um, if your day isn't shortening up very much, if um, it's not getting very cold at all in the winter time, there might not be enough trigger to tell these plants to go dormant. When I used to live in Indonesia, where I managed uh, Milesiana Tropicals, which is a tropical pitcher plant nursery, we had a whole table of really super sad Saracenia. We were right on the equator then, uh, right there, so there was zero change in uh, photo period or day length and it never got colder than 76 degrees ever. And when Saracenia are exposed to those kind of tropical, tropical conditions and there's no triggers to go dormant, they just get sadder and sadder and sadder every single year. Thinner, 
thinner, sad little leany little pitchers until it just one falls over and they're done. So it can be tricky. Now, not impossible. So the fridge method is another good method for you too. It's not just for the freezing cold people, it's also for the sweltering hot people where it doesn't, where we have no winter. So you, you can um, put those plants in the fridge. You're gonna have to force them. This one, you will have to do something to make them go dormant. So you are gonna have to cut them back forcefully. You're gonna put it in a bag and put it in the fridge in the dark, it will go dormant and then pop it back out in the spring. It's still, not as good as probably growing them where there is a real winter, but uh, you can have some success, some success growing American pitcher plants in a very tropical environment like that. Beyond dormancy, honestly, most of the care generally is pretty much the same uh, no matter where you are. Watering is rainwater and distilled water only, although I will say, American pitcher plants are somewhat more tolerant of minerals in their water than other carnivorous plants. Venus flytraps, very sensitive. American pitcher plants, super less sensitive. We have tap water that runs about 150 parts per million here, um, not here at the nursery, but here around us in the residences. And those people actually have no problem growing Saracenia with that water, um, as long as they're allowed to be rained on pretty heavily in the winter time and flush out those minerals. You're also probably gonna wash the saucer once in a while. There's such a thing as mineral buildup, so, Every time I put a gallon of water in here and there was a hundred parts per million dissolved solids in there, the water leaves and the minerals stay. And so every single time I'm watering with a little bit of minerals in the water, it's slowly marching up. When it gets to about 300, 350 parts per million, that's when even your American pitcher plants will probably start to die. So. Um, you can use some tap water on these, but you have to make sure to wash those saucers. You have to make sure that the rain is flushing them out regularly, because if that builds up, they will die. Maybe you don't want to have them for life like I do. I know I appreciate the fact that we're all in this for different reasons, and some of us just want to appreciate them easily for a couple of years, and it's not so important if they're alive in 30 years. So you can totally do that with some tap water. Um, Within their range, they're native uh, exclusively to wetlands, swamps, bogs, um, all kinds of places like that where there's alligators and mosquitoes. Um, because of that, they want their feet to be wet at all times. And so we just set them in trays of that pure water at all times. It's pretty hard to overdo. Um, one of the things to think about is you don't want to have pots that are much taller, I would say, than 8 to 12 inches because it gets really hard for the water to absorb all that way up to the top and sometimes the top stays kind of too dry. Um, and probably, uh, you know, a nice depth on a pot, average pot for an average Saracenia is about 6 inches or so. Uh, they will do in shallower pots, but they do kind of like to get their roots down, especially if you want much larger pitchers. Um, as far as pots go, the same rules as all carnivorous plants uh, apply. Don't use um, terracotta pots because they'll leach minerals into your peat moss and eventually cause problems. Don't use any metal pots. Um, stainless steel will probably be okay, but anything short of that is going to be eaten up by the peat moss. It's very acidic and so iron, copper, any of that will immediately start to be eaten up like almost like seawater. And then as it does that, it's breaking down into rusts and minerals that again, they'll harm your plants. So um, plastic, that's great. If you don't like the look of our ugly little plastic pots, like lots of ladies don't like that, um, a beautiful glazed ceramic pot is fine. And don't kill yourself looking for the three pots out there that are glazed inside. If it's glazed on the outside, it's a hard fire and you don't have to worry about the minerals leaching out of the clay. So don't worry about that so much. Also like fiberglass or any of those pots that you can find at Home Depot that are non-reactive are totally fine. Glass would also be fine. Um, they're great for bog gardens. Bog gardens are mixed planters of carnivorous plants. And they're so spectacular, they're so beautiful, and they have so many different colors. It can be really beautiful to mix these all together into what we call a bog garden or a mixed planter. You can add Venus flytraps, you can add sundews, like threadleaf sundews and forkleaf sundews, and they're all totally happy 
to live together. And because carnivorous plants are trapping their fertilizer from the insects they catch, their roots are very, not even hardly involved with nutrient uptake. And so because of that, um, you can have plants be very close together and very pot bound looking and still look really spectacular. Uh, as far as light goes, um, most of these plants grow in uh, areas where the trees are either being frequently burned or the ground is so wet that trees aren't able to grow. So like down in the southeast United States, when I visit these in the wild, picture um, grassy fields with short pine trees, 20 to 30 foot tall, long needle pines, which are really super beautiful in their own right. And in the wet, soggy places between these um, pine trees where the pine trees can't grow, there are American pitcher plants growing out in the full hot sun. And that's Alabama full hot sun, which is a lot hotter than California sun usually. I mean, we have some hot, you know, Death Valley gets super hot, but most here, mostly here, a hot day for us is gonna be like 100 degrees and it's really short and fleeting. In the south, the temperatures there are gonna be like, if you know, if I'm visiting these plants in the wild, it's often 100, 105 degrees in September and 100% humidity. And these guys are just glowing out in the horrible hot sun while we slowly melt and drink lots of water and then hop in the air-conditioned car and try not to die. That's a brief window into looking at carnivorous plants in the wild. Um, but because of that, they can really take the sun. Now, the only, you know, if you're in an area, like I said, if you're in a very hot and dry area, like maybe Death Valley, if you're in Arizona and people do grow them in places like that, you're not gonna do them in full all day sun like we would here in Northern California. Um, give them a little break. They'll do in half a day sun. So it's gonna be really hard to keep them sitting in water when it gets over a hundred degrees for you. Um, you can put them into a really big basin. It can be in a big dish basin that you put a couple of gallons water in if that's what you're up against, um, but it's still gonna be hard. So cut yourself a little break and give them a little less sun. I would move them into a spot around probably around April or May, anytime where the temperatures are getting above 90 consistently, I would move them to some afternoon shade. It'd be great if they were like on the east side of the house where they were getting really hot morning sun to color them up nicely, but then, uh, you know, a little afternoon shade as the house goes over the, goes, or the sun goes over the house. Um, the other thing is not enough light. Uh, it's hard to grow sericina in the woods. It really is. If you're in a really uh, overgrown tree, you know, wooded area, sericina might not be the ones for you. They really do need a lot of sun. If you grow them in not, too, in not enough light, you won't get any of these beautiful red colors. The pitchers don't know how to stand up right. Ideolation means that the cells start to stre uh, stretch out and look for the light. So if you've ever noticed on you know any of your house plants at home where the leaves start to get really, really weirdly big, well, in the pitchers, they start looking for light and so they just get straggly and they start falling over and running out of the place. So they're really not that attractive in low light. So, and they can be tricky to grow under artificial light because they're so such tall plants. Um, it's kind of hard to know where to keep the lights because as they grow, it'd be great if the lights were here, but they're coming up several inches every single day. And so it gets really tricky. All you can really do is put the artificial light up here and they're gonna kind of stretch up to it and then maybe burn on top. People are probably pulling it off, mostly with shorter plants. This is Saracenia purpurea, the purple pitcher plant. There's also the parrot pitcher plants, Saracena cytosina. Um, those are lower, and you could grow these guys under lights probably. Um, the Yescom lights that they sell on Amazon um, can be really terrific. They'll color up underneath those. Um, but again, the tall ones can be tricky. But the short ones are okay. So soil. We grow our American pitcher plants in our general mix that we've used for years and years and years here. And that is four parts peat to one part perlite. Now you could substitute uh, washed horticultural sand or play sand for the perlite if you want to. It will make for heavier pots, but it's slightly more attractive possibly because the perlite will kind of float up to the top. But our, our uh, mix of four parts peat to one part perlite is really super tried and true. Um, we use the, uh, mostly we use the black gold brand or sunshine brand of peat moss. If you can find that at Home Depot, usually you can. Um, if you're not finding peat moss where you live, again, it can be kind of hard to grow these without peat moss. Um, a short-term solution could be cocoa peat, 
you could substitute that with peat moss, but because we're sitting it in the water, excuse me, it's gonna break down really fast. And so you might be able to do that with constant repotting, but these days, I mean, people are wasting peat moss for a lot of other things, and so just a couple pots of carnivorous plants. If you can track it down, that's what I would use. So we'll move into uh, fertilizing. As I said earlier, uh, you know, all carnivorous plants are trapping the prey that they catch for fertilizer that they cannot get from the soil. So in those bogs and swamps, um, there's almost no nutrition in the peat moss for them. That's all been leached away for millennia by all the water. And so they've evolved this clever ability to catch insects that they don't even know are there uh, and catch all their fertilizer. And American pitcher plants are the big gluttons of the carnivorous plant world. We get a lot of people who think they're gonna order a Venus flytrap and it's gonna get rid of all the flies in their neighborhood, or a lot of people are gonna buy a couple Cape Sundews and that's gonna be the end of all the mosquitoes that ever existed. And I really encourage people to grow these plants because they're beautiful and not because they're gonna end the world of bugs. But that being said, if you have a lot of bugs in your yard and you wanna satisfactorily, you know, with satisfaction, watch them disappear, American pitcher plants are for you. One of the sounds of my childhood is the buzzing of little flies and bees from the insides of these pitchers. Um, and they will completely fill up the nectar that they produce along the rain lid, and this is a rain lid, it never moves unless they go like this. But other than that, it only pops up and it's just made to keep the water from going inside this pitcher and toppling it over so it can't catch, catch any more bugs. But the nectar, that they produce to lure them into the trap is particularly concentrated on top of this. So it adds like a little landing platform and then the yellow jacket will run around here eating all the nectar. And then it's like, you know what? The most nectar is down here, guys. And they'll come down into the throat where there's the most nectar, but it's also very, very slippery and they slide down inside. And the nectar does make them drunk. And so they've lost all their inhibitions and they're walking around this delicate edge and they top a lot in. Um, so you don't need to fill these up with water either. You don't do that. They're gonna do that all on their own. That being said, the parrot pitcher plant does not have a rain lid and it can fill up with water. That's totally fine. And it's actually recommended. If you want it to keep eating, it's a good idea. Um, you don't need to feed these though. If you're growing them outside where they should be, they'd be covered in bugs. And by this time of year, already filled up that far with insects and by that point they're not going to catch any more bugs and people often ask well what do I do with that like am I going to fish that out is the plant going to poop someday no it's just going to lose all these pitchers when it gets cold in about three weeks and then we'll cut those all off around January and they'll all come back again from the rhizome like a bearded iris over and over again every single year a little bit bigger and once they get to their optimum height they slowly spread that way and so you will end up with you know over the years with big giant clumps like I have outside um, so you don't have to worry about feeding them they're gonna fill up with bugs like crazy and because you don't have to worry about that you probably also don't have to worry about fertilizing them if you're a crazy Saracenia guy and you know who you are um, you are fertilizing them also and that's totally fine I fertilize them also and if you're in a greenhouse situation like this and there's a million thousand carnivorous plants all around and nobody's ever catching any bugs it's a good idea to fertilize but if they're outside and they're catching lots of bugs and you're not a crazy person about all this just let them do their thing and don't worry about it that being said the maxi fertilizer has been, uh, we popularized that years ago to be used on carnivorous plants. Uh, we sell it at our nursery. And um, you can either do a quarter of a teaspoon per gallon, or you can also measure it with a TDS meter at about 250, to maybe even 300 parts per million. Anywhere in, anywhere in there is totally acceptable. Um, you can sprinkle them all foliarly uh, with a watering can like that. You could also put it, um, you can make it a little weaker and put it directly into the tray of water and let them sop that up. Or you can squirt gun that directly into the mouths. You don't want to fill it up so much that it falls over and spills it because we're not eating anything that way. Um, but you can even make it a little stronger and squirt gun it directly into the pitchers themselves. They will grow faster that way. And if you're growing baby American pitcher plants from seed, that would be classically, without any fertilizer, about a three-year-old plant from seed.
Um, you can speed that up, probably take a couple years off of that. If you grow them under lights when they're small, you can skip a winter or two on American pitcher plant babies. Um, and you can fertilize them when they're little. If you're waiting for a little baby American pitcher plant like that to catch its first meal and grow, it could be a really, really long time. So a little fertilizer on the baby ones is a good idea not to be overdone so you don't encourage the moss too much. Now I want to talk about uh, what happens when we encounter problems. I did do a long uh, video for the ICPS that was called, uh, it was all about pesticides and I called it, you know, it's all fun and games until somebody gets aphids. And that's really true. There is such a thing as beginner's luck. You might get a couple of these plants, things might be growing really super well, and then all of a sudden you accidentally created a little niche. You have these beautiful Saracenia growing, and now there's a little niche for aphids or maybe mealybugs, and there are problems the same, even though these ironically all eat bugs. These all suffer the same um, pest problems that almost all plants can suffer from. And I wanna talk about some of those. First off, something that almost never happens that people worry about a lot, and that is root rot. Like I said, these are from swamps. Um, unless you're like in a really humid spot, like if you're in Alabama and you're like next to where they grow in the wild and it's really, really hot down there, sometimes you can run into some root rot on smaller plants. And so it may be a good idea to back off on the watering just a little bit in the winter time. That being said, here, we will take, we'll bare root of Saracenia, and you know, a lot of times we're busy here, there's thousands. We'll put it in a bucket of water and come back a week later, two weeks later, sometimes a whoops, a month later, oh my God, it's been three months and it's still sitting in that bucket of water. And they're actually totally just fine. It's really, really hard to rot these guys. And likewise, in the wild, they'll often either be floating in water or we water up on top of them for a month while the rain settles back out. So don't really worry about that too much. Probably worrying too much about that. Um, they can get aphids. Aphids are tiny little insects. They're green, orange, brown, but they're tiny, tiny. Um, totally visible with the human eye, but sometimes you don't see them. I usually look for their little white old aphid skins and husks all around and like, oh, that's probably aphids, look closer. Um, and look for twisted leaves. I don't have a good example of that because I'm pretty quick to kill any aphid in here. But uh, these leaves will get all twisted and deformed and that's usually a great sign that something must be done. Um, there's numerous pesticides that you can use. Uh, if you have access to like orthene, that's fine. And that's systemic. That'll last for like a month and make sure that it keeps killing the pest. Any of the bare uh, products with imidacloprid as the um, active ingredient, totally fine. Not so great for honeybees, so be careful about how you use it, but totally fine for the Saracenia. If you really want something organic, you can even use like a um, takedown. This, uh, Totally available online and it's uh, pyrethrin and canola oil. Pyrethrin comes from chrysanthemums so that's pretty non-toxic. Um, so if you're treating any pest I would treat that two or three times about a week apart just to make sure you didn't miss any of those scraggly little survivors. Beyond aphids, mealybug is really probably common. I think most of that mealybug has actually been treated and dead already. But the dead giveaway is going to be this white fluffiness at the base of the rhizome. It almost always starts there. And then they'll start to hitchhike up the pitchers as they grow or up the flower stalks. And you will see them up higher on the plants, but it usually starts down in here. And you can pull away these old pitcher scales. That gives them a place to hide. You can see I'm exposing them now by pulling that away. And that makes them easier to treat. I would also go take this first thing, I would probably take um, some rubbing alcohol and a toothbrush because rubbing alcohol will kill them on contact and just scrub all that away. And then once they're good and dead, I would take this um, with a garden hose and just put a good spray on that and blast all that fluffy white stuff off. It's like a matrix that they make that they hide inside and repels water and keeps them safe. Um, the ants will farm both of those. They'll also uh, farm hard scale, and they can be a problem on these plants as well. So if you see a lot of ant activity, although sometimes they're just eating the ants, which is great, but sometimes the ants have uh, started their own farming situation down here, and they're raising your pest insects. Again, the same pesticides that I mentioned earlier can be really effective on these. 
If you want to go really hardcore on them, although it is expensive, there's one called Tau Star that I really, really like. Um, it's very, very effective, but very, very expensive. Um, but once you get it under control and you clean it all up and you hit it a few times, you can usually get rid of them. It's much more a problem in greenhouses or indoors than it is outside. Mealybug likes the protection from the rain and the cold and the wind. So when you have them outside in the you know, sh you know, shuck and jive of the world, they're way less likely to pop up. But they can be a problem in greenhouses. Another problem, only a real fungal problem that we see regularly on them that hurts them is powdery mildew. It can be really obvious on red plants like this one, you can see this white patchiness here. So that's a fungus. When you're seeing that sporulation of it, it's already inside the plant. And so you could wipe it away. It's pretty easy to wipe off, but it'll still be there. Um, there are lots of fungicides that you can buy to treat this, um, but honestly, pure elemental sul sulfur has been the best option for me. Um, I just do one big heaping tablespoon in a gallon of water inside a uh, watering can. I agitate that really well with the, um, with the spray head of a hose to really work it up because it is kind of hard to get to dis dis uh, dissolve. And then I just wet the entire plant with the watering can and all the neighboring plants. Every time a drop of normal water lands on that and splatters somewhere else, it can spread. So once you see that, you also want to stop spraying it with water. Don't make sure you're not spraying the foliage over and over again. Um, the sulfur will leave little sulfur spots. That's not powdery mildew there. That's a previous treatment. It's been a little resistant to come off of here. So those are the sulfur spots. That's totally fine. It's a little unsightly. You can wash them off if you're really persnickety, but it's good to leave it on there because it's um, prohibiting the powdery mildew. Um, it's more of a problem when they're actively growing in the spring and summer. I like to um, treat them all prohibitively with the sulfur while they're dormant before all the new pitchers come up. That's a really great time to do a dormant spray on those. Another thing I wanted to talk about is sooty mold that occurs on the nectar of Saracenia. So this is an anthocyanin-free Saracenia. Anthocyanin is the red pigment in plants. And so when they're anthocyanin-free, they're basically albino and incapable of making any red pigment. It's funny because that city mold is on all of these plants. I guarantee it. It's on all these flavas that are so pretty, and it's definitely on this, but you can't see it because it's so dark red. Lots of people love anthocyanin-free plants. There's people that totally fixate on that. We're always making new ones here that are really cool. But you should expect that there will sometimes be a kind of black city mold on them. It's totally harmless. It's just the sugars in their uh, nectar lure molding. If you put any sugar in a wet environment, it's going to mold. But it's not hurting the plant at all. So, you know, nature is full of all kinds of imperfections that people like us may not like, but it's our job in a Zen way to swallow that down and just accept it for what it is. And that's absolutely the case with that city mold. So don't worry about that. Another thing not to worry about is sometimes the nectar gets so concentrated on top of the lid, it'll create like a little droplet. And that little droplet will sometimes create a lensing effect that the strong sun will burn little brown spots on top of the lid. That's called nectar burn. Also, uh, an unavoidable fact of healthy Saracenia. So don't worry about that either. Um, I think that's most of the major problems that they get. I would say as a carnivorous plant genus, they're uh, relatively problem free. Oh, one more thing I should talk about is the phenomenon of late summer thrips, especially in really thick Saracenia stands. If you have big plants like I do that are this big across, Deep inside there gives a really cozy spot for another little uh, pest called thrips. They're hard to see with the naked eye, but if you get down in there and you look, you'll see a little elongated green or uh, brown, little, little tiny little guy. So, so wee, so tiny, um, but they can be seen. More what I look is, more what I see is thrips damage. It's right around late summer on the flavas. Very often you'll look and it'll look kind of, um, gray and silvery, kind of the pictures will look dull, and there'll be little brown flecks in that silveriness. That's thrips damage. They're actually rasping 
the uh, pitcher tissue with their mouth parts and damaging it and then defecating on the leaves to create that weird silvery brownness. Um, there's a pesticide called Monterey Bay Garden Spray with the active ingredient of spinosad that is also organic but um, really effective against thrips. I always use that specifically for thrips um, because it stays on the leaf for about a month and as they continue to rasp on the leaves it'll keep killing any new ones that happen. It's even a good idea to go out around, I don't know, May, June and preemptively treat your plants with that spinosad just to make sure that nobody takes hold. Again, if you're persnickety and you can't stand it. Generally, thrips can take a lot of damage, especially when they work down onto the rhizome. They can really start to dehydrate that rhizome and hurt it. They are capable of killing a plant, but generally it's usually a problem late summer and they die in the winter too. And when you cut them back in the spring or in the fall, then usually it's just fine. Um, just cleaning them up is, you know, you don't have to clean them up, like I said, um, during, throughout the year, you don't have to cut every little brown pitcher off. I don't, nobody does that in the wild but it is a good idea to cut them all completely back to their rhizome in January. And I do that all at once, once a year. I do that with old flowers. I do that with old pitchers, even if they look nice, I'm probably just gonna cut them all off. And I just do it right there. You can see about the height we did it at last year. You can be much tighter if you have more time. It is probably good to get really close to the rhizome. If you wanna get really nuts, you can always pull the two year ones away like that just pull those off of there not that one though <laughs> but those and that keeps them looking a little cleaner and keeps them from getting mealy bug you know you'll do this when you have t one plant you'll do this when you have 10 plants when you have a thousand million plants like me maybe you'll pay somebody to do this <laughs> but we don't have time to clean every single saracenia just like that but you can so although saracenia suffer from all those common pest problems another thing that they generally don't suffer from i can't really think of ever seeing um, Saracenia attacked by spider mites. Doesn't mean it's impossible because nature's a big, big, brave world out there. But generally, I would say that spider mites is probably not happening. Um, that being said, you know, just because you've heard of a spider mite doesn't mean that the myriad, huge world of soil mites, predatory mites, decomposing mites, uh, is completely understood by you or me or anybody actually. We're still trying to figure out what all these mites do. We do know that any little spoonful of soil has thousands and thousands of soil mites in it. We do know that if you look closely at the peristome of your Saracenia, you may see little weird mites crawling around there. We think they hitch rides on the bees. We don't really know their whole life cycle yet, but they're not harmful. Um, if you see a big giant orange mite running all over it, that's probably not spider mite either. It's probably predatory looking for the same horrible spider mites to kill that you are. Spider mites are incredibly teeny tiny. If you're seeing it, it probably isn't. And if you see webs, yes, spider mites make webs. It has web right in the name, but you better have, it's like, uh, it's they gotta be the Los Angeles of spider mite city in order for it to see webs. If you're seeing webs, it's major. It, if you're seeing, usually um, a web is just a spider web, Maybe it's a little fungus knot webbing or something at the soil, but you're probably not seeing spider mites. Please stop sending us emails. <laughs> we're just at, if you send us a picture, a clear picture, we're always happy to identify pests for you. But we can hedge that one off and say that probably isn't. Second thing you might see, we get a lot of emails saying that like, there's a little worm that came out of the pot and it's swimming around in the water. What is this worm? I don't know. Maybe it's an eel worm or a horse, a horse tail worm, but all those little worms are non-harmful. Um, they're not going to do anything to you or the plants. Stop trying to kill every little thing and sterilize the world. There's a lot of creatures in the world. Also, uh, springtails. Sometimes you'll see springtails on the on the fresh peat moss, and they're jumping around. They're tiny, tiny little gray guys that jump. They're also fine. Leave those guys alone. It's okay. They don't have to kill everything. Um, but yeah, those are pretty much the uh, a few things that we get a lot of questions about that actually aren't problems. Probably. And then I, I want to launch into conservation a little bit um, because why you grow these plants is such a question. You know, why I grow these plants? For one, they're beautiful. And another thing, we've really got them on the ropes. As I said earlier, they're native to wetlands and swamps. Um, we've been really terrible to wetlands. We've been terrible to the entire planet Earth, honestly. But we started with the wetlands. When Europeans first got here to North America, 
there was huge swaths of long needle pines and wetlands in between. And one of the first things that we did was start to build roads, ditches, um, dams, and uh, bogs became lakes and reservoirs. And if you drive, if you, if you make a road down the middle of a bog and put two ditches on either side of the road, what happens is all the water from no matter how big that bog is, all the water will suck into those ditches and then all the Saracenia are forced to retreat all throughout the bog, they'll just keep moving, and the only survivors will be the ones right up against the side of the road. So if you're from the south and you're driving around, you will see a lot of roadside sites, but what you're missing is the acres and acres of Saracenia habitat that used to exist. And then, um, carnivorous plants, uh, well, all the United States carnivorous plants are dependent on fire. And depending on fire is kind of a weird thing. I think more and more of us are becoming aware of the importance of fire in conservation, but the general public thinks of fire as a really destructive thing and something to be quickly put out so our house doesn't burn down. Well, in doing that, we've interrupted fire cycles. So many plants, including Saracenia, are completely dependent on that fire, uh, fire cycle. And in the southeastern United States, where it's literally a combination of explosively flammable long needle pines and lightning storms all summer long, it would have burned. Almost every single year, almost every single bog would have burned. And now it doesn't. So we got rid of the fire cycle and we got in the way of the water cycle. Now carnivorous plants are um, trying to survive and trying to adapt with even what we're throwing at them. And so um, they're in the south they have a thing called power cuts and that is the cleared land underneath the big metal power lines and they have to do that for maintenance. So they were clearing all that out and that became another refuge of carnivorous plants because even though we're not burning the brush away, we had people that were going out there and physically clearing the brush and that gives enough light and enough clearance for all these guys to continue to thrive. The fire is beating back the trees, beating back the shrubs, beating back the grass and allowing these guys to continue to flourish there where they grow. Um, so we got in the way of that and we got in the way of the water, but we started physically clearing them and mowing those roadsides and keeping those clear and so the carnivorous plants have been lingering there. Now, something that I saw coming even uh, starting to change uh, 10 years ago when I started visiting the plants, almost 20 years ago now, um, was Roundup. It's way cheaper to round up roadsides and power cuts than it is to pay people to physically clear it. And so power cuts are being aerially uh, broadcast Roundup um, and where they just spray Roundup on either side of the road now as opposed to mowing it. Now, that simple decision that's saving, you know, the money to people is actually destroying these last remaining populations. And sadly, most of these plants are um, not respected where they grow. There's very little information about them. They're considered um, troublesome if they're on your property because if you find this endangered species on your property, they're gonna limit what you can do to your land. And so people actively still destroy them. Um, people are actively still destroying habitat every single day to build Walmarts and overpasses and parking lots. And um, they're really in rough shape. You know, Saracenia oreophila, which is the most endangered probably of all of the species from northern Alabama. I think it's down to nine small sites. That's it. Um, Saracenia rubra jonesi, also extremely, extremely endangered. And Saracenia um, rubra subspecies albumensis. All three of those are practically extinct, but the rest of them are in really rough shape too. And another thing that I uh, talk about a lot uh, to people is climate change. You know, these are all in low-lying freshwater areas. And when the sea level rises, that salt water is gonna inundate these areas. And I expect in my lifetime to see lots and lots of freshwater Saracenia habitat become saltwater marsh, which is of course uninhabitable to them. Um, so it's really important 
uh, it's really important to donate when you can. There's the North American Saracenia Conservancy, and you can donate directly to them on our webpage when you're placing your orders, and there's no good excuse not to do that. And they do a lot of great work, real foot on the feet on the ground work of relocating plants to safer areas without disturbing genetics, um, really thoughtful conservation work. Um, and of course, you can grow these plants. And that will be twofold. Lots of people are hard on this, you know. They say that people aren't capable of long-term cultivation to make enough conservation impact. I gently usually disagree with that. We've made numerous things here that, um, you know, seeds horticulturally that wouldn't be done otherwise. And whether that'll continue a thousand years from now, I think it's smart for us to do everything we can. Yes, conserve the land, but yes, grow these plants outside of it in case that it all becomes salt marsh and there's absolutely none of them left. So you can do your small part by donating and also growing these beautiful plants and showing your neighbors. That's why I've devoted my entire life to teaching people and growing these beautiful plants so that they'd be way less likely to get on board with destroying beautiful places. If you live in the Southeast United States, you can also vote. Um, Blackwater, uh, Blackwater National Forest is a super beautiful area full of all these plants and they're dying to frack in there. Don't let them frack in Blackwater State Forest. Please, don't. Um, but yeah, they're in really rough shape and um, I, expect most, I expect to see extinctions in our lifetime. Even things like the Venus flytrap are in that same kind of rough shape. Um, anyways, uh, if you've never tried growing Saracenia, I hope that now you're inspired to give it a shot. They really are fantastic plants. They really will catch all of your yellow jackets. And if you take good care of them like me, they really will be with you for your entire life. I'm not joking about that. I still have the ones from when I was 12 and there's, I don't see any reason why when I pass away, they won't still all exist here and probably be even taken care of after that. Um, so there's no reason to think of these as like a weird novelty that you're just gonna take home and kill. But if you do it right, like I just told you, they can actually absolutely be with you forever. Anyways, uh, thanks so much for learning about these amazing plants with me and stay tuned for more ultra care guides. Look at the timestamps down below. If this got long winded for you, you can skip ahead to any of the parts that I'm talking about and like and follow and ask plenty of questions down in those comments because we're always happy to answer them. Thank you so much.